good afternoon, dear students. Uh, more questions to be answered on uh, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Uh, let's begin by answering the first question, which is, please uh, write this down. The first question, how did Bob Cratchit's family describe Scrooge? How did Bob Cratchit's family describe Scrooge? Uh, you will find a direct answer to that question on page number uh, 74. 74. Uh, when uh, Bob's wife says uh, at the middle section of the page, uh, of course, at this moment, uh, her husband, Bob Cratchit, uh, is asking the family uh, to drink a toast after the health of uh, his master, Scrooge, which enrages the wife and says, it should be Christmas Day, I'm sure. It is true that this is Christmas time, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, horrible. How can we drink after the health of such an odious, which means horrible, stingy, miser, hard, look at how many negative descriptions of Scrooge, hard, unfeeling man, senseless man, a man with no feelings, as Mr. Scrooge. You know, he is Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. And then, uh, a little bit later, on the same page, a few lines later, uh, the paragraph before the final one, the paragraph before the final one, uh, in the middle, exactly in the middle. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. Of course, you know that the ogre is a very frightening giant. The ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, on this family which wasn't dispelled, which uh, it refers to this image, wasn't dispelled, wasn't disregarded, okay, or wasn't uh, discarded by the family. Get uh, rid, get rid of, okay, dispel is to discard or get rid of something. Wasn't dispelled for four or five minutes. It remained in their memory, okay. Uh, Question number two. Discuss the conditions of Bob Cratchit's family. Uh, you'll find the answer to this question on page number 75. Uh, the first paragraph located in the middle of the page. There was nothing of high mark in this. Listen to this delicate a precise description of the family. They were not a handsome family, that's true. They weren't well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty, very few clothes. And of course, in case uh, there are, uh, then these clothes are worn out. And Peter might have known, and very likely dead, the inside of a pawn broker's. He never went to a, a money lender. But they were, despite these horrible conditions of them, they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. Here, Charles Dickens gives us this description of this wretched family to compare the conditions to those of uh, Mr. Scrooge himself. Uh, a third question, expose Fred's family's feelings. 
toward their uncle. Okay, you'll find an answer to this on pages number 80 and 81. On page number 80, at the top section of the page, search for what of that, my dear? They are talking about uh, Scrooge. Of course, this is Fred and his wife. What a, what of that, my dear? Says Scrooge's nephew. His hell, his wealth, Scrooge's wealth, is of no use to him. He don't do any good with it. He don't make himself comfortable with it. He's a stingy man. He means he is a stingy man and doesn't want to uh, uh, to spend his money over trivialities as those of Christmas as mentioned in the first stave of this uh, novel. He don't make himself comfortable with that. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking that he is ever going to benefit U.S. with that. I have no patience with him. This is his wife, his niece, Scrooge's niece. I have no patience with him. Scrooge's niece's sisters and all the other ladies uh, in this family, the family of Fred, express the same opinion. I have no patience with him. Oh, I have, but Fred does have some patience. He can wait for this man to change. He doesn't lose hope, said Scrooge's nephew. I am very sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. He is so loyal to his uncle. He doesn't want to abandon his uncle, whatever uh, happens. Who suffers by his ill whims, his ill attitudes, himself always. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us. And he won't come and dine with us. He doesn't want, he refused. He declined the invitation made by uh, Fred at the beginning of this novel, as you remember, of course. Uh, he doesn't want to dine with us. What's the consequence? He don't lose much of a dinner. Then let's move to question number uh, four. Sort out the blessings. Sort out the blessings of the ghost of Christmas present as enumerated by the writer, by Charles Dickens, as mentioned by Charles Dickens. You'll find an answer to this on page number 85. The different blessings of this ghost of Christmas present. Page number 85. The paragraph beginning with, in the middle, much the so, and far the went, and many homes the visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood like beside sick beds. This is number one of the many blessings of this ghost. He stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful by sprinkling with the droplets of his torch. And they were cheerful on foreign lands. People uh, outside of London, outside of even England, and they were close at home. By he stood by by struggling men, suffering men, and they were were patient in the greater hope. He gave them hope. By poverty, stood by poverty by poor people. And it was rich. He turned poverty into rich richness. Okay? It means that he turned poor people into rich people. Of course, all of these apply to the case of Scrooge, who now feels discomfort, regret, as at not being so. Then, the following paragraph, beginning with, it was a long night. Uh, here we have 
an answer to the fifth question. Question number five. Why did Scrooge doubt the reality of the journey? This is a very important question. Why did Scrooge at that moment doubt the reality of the journey being made in company of that, of that uh, ghost of Christmas present? You'll find the answer on page again, on the same page, A25. And this paragraph beginning with, It was a long night. If it were only a night, but Scrooge had his doubts of this. He doubted the entire journey because it was maybe a mere fancy, a mere glimpse of his imagination because the Christmas holidays appear to be condensed into the space of time they passed together. Too short time for such journeys to be made just in just one night it was strange to that another facet of uh, strangeness that while scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form the past time they indeed uh, surpass bridge over time passing so many years even uh, in this section regarding the uh, the ghost of a Christmas past and then coming to the ghost of a Christmas present they exceed the limits of time and space as well and Scrooge still the same he doesn't change his shape is the same he's supposed to get older but he is not okay uh, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older. Clearly older. But the ghost becoming older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it. Until they left the children's twelfth night party, when looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed that its hair was gray. So Scrooge himself wasn't wasn't uh, wasn't object an object of change, unlike the ghost who uh, undergone who has undergone much uh, change. Uh, question number six, and this is again one of the most important questions in the entire. Uh, discussion of, of uh, Christmas Carol. Uh, dis describe ignorance and want. Of course, you remember that ignorance and want are uh, a boy and a girl hiding beneath the robe of uh, this Christmas presents uh, attire. Okay, describe ignorance and want as portrayed by Dickens and elaborate on their symbolism as characters. On page number 86. 86. The paragraph beginning with, or this line beginning with, I see something strange. I see something strange. And not belonging to yourself, it is not part of your body or clothes. Okay, uh, protruding from your skirts, sticking out of your clothes. Is it a foot or a claw? He said. He answered, "This ghost, it might be claw for the flesh there is upon it." While the spirit's sorrowful reply, look here, from the foldings of its robe, from beneath this robe, it brought, the ghost brought two children, how Charles Dickens described these two children, Richard, very poor, abject, terrible or helpless, they were terrible and helpless 
frightful, hideous. It means very ugly, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. Oh man, look here, look down here, exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meager, which means small and poor, small in size and poor, ragged, they put on old or worn out, okay, torn apart clothes, ragged, scowling, looking angry. At the same time, they were so angry. Of course, uh, sorry, of course, Charles Dickens means that they are angry at the society, the negligence of the society. Wolfish. Wolfish means like a, like a wolf. Wolfish here means or symbolize, this word symbolizes untamed, rampants, homeless, uncivilized people living on the streets. Wolfish, but prostrate too in their humility. They were so uh, shocked at the way people humiliate them. On the opposite page, 87, uh, this paragraph beginning with spirit. Spirit, are they yours? A question delivered by Scrooge asking uh, the ghost. And the ghost replies, they are man's. These two children are uh, the children of mankind. They're products of mankind. Mankind is responsible for these two products, ignorance and want. The spirit looking down upon them and they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance. His name is ignorance. This girl is want. Of course, these two names are so symbolic. Okay. Uh, representing real ignorance of the society and uh, poverty in the society. Beware of them both. Take care of them. All and all of their degree. But most of all, beware this boy. He warns Scrooge against the boy more than the girl. But why? The girl is named Ignorance. Here, Charles Dickens uh, might mean that ignorance results in poverty, crime, and immorality. Ignorance is the reason of all. Poverty, crime, and immorality. So the most important thing to be paid attention to is this boy, ignorance. For on his brow I see that written which is doom, the end, the end of the society, okay, uh, resides in ignorance, the destruction of the society, unless the writing is raised, unless the future is rewritten, unless the society changes its behavior toward people who are ignorant and in want and poor, deny it, deny this image. Scrooge cried the spirit, stretching out its hand towards the city. What is more uh, considered as a direct proof that uh, the addressee here, the addressee, the addressing being here in this context, in these lines, is the society itself when he stretches out his hand towards the city. Slander, 
those who tell it here. Shame or defame those who tell that ignorance and want are the responsibility of certain individuals in society. No, it is the responsibility of the entire society. Admit it for your factious purposes. Here the word factious refers to the sections or the political sections of the society. The parties, Al-Ahzab, the parties of the society. This or these two issues must be addressed by uh, the policy makers of the society and uh, make it worse uh, and abide the end beware of the end have they no refuge or resource Scrooge is asking are there no prisons again this ghost makes fun or ridicules the own words of Scrooge made at the first uh, a chapter are there no prisons said the spirit turning on him for the last time with his own words are there no workhouses the same exclamations made by Scrooge to the two gentlemen who came inside his shop asking for charity uh, thank you uh, dear students and see you inshallah uh, in uh, next lectures.